Well, let's uh, go back to the Word of God in Romans 7. Good to see everybody this morning. How many of you mothers are looking forward to being taken out to eat today after church? Not all the hands are going to shoot up. You know, maybe your husband won't make you cook today for lunch. How many of you ladies normally cook for lunch on Sundays? Raise your hand if you normally cook. How many of you go out to eat normally on Sunday? Oh, okay, so actually it's more of a majority of those that go out to eat. Maybe that's why we start church so early now, so that we can beat the other churches to lunch. I don't know. But, um, but thank you for being here, and it has been a wonderful beginning to our year. We've had a great uh, switch over to our schedule in this 930 service. I hope you're enjoying it. I hope you can see the benefit of starting at this time and, and then having our small groups to follow up afterwards. I've really enjoyed the starting point class and all the guests that have been coming to that. I've been having a chance to get to meet them, get to know them better. And so uh, we're, we're just thrilled at what God is doing here in our church. And uh, God is good. Amen? He's been blessing. And uh, we're just thankful for what He has been doing because of His mercy, His grace, His sovereign plan. And so we just continue to trust Him in all things. When the times are good, when the times are not so good... Uh, we choose to exercise faith. And faith really is, an, uh, is this idea of changing one's mind to believe something different. Uh, the, the greatest responsibility in the church today is that they would change their mind, that they would repent, that they would change their mind about what truth is, that they would set their minds upon the truth and the hope and the good news of the gospel. And so a gospel preacher will continually call you to repent, to change your mind about the most important thing in the world, in all of reality, and that is the truth of the Word of God, the truth of the gospel. Uh, last week, we were in Romans chapter 7, verses 1 through 13. We're going through the book of Romans. Uh, the title of the series is Unwrapping the Gospel. We're simply seeking to understand this wonderful book that the Holy Spirit penned through the life of the Apostle Paul as he wrote to the Church of Rome, and he talked about the power of the gospel. And we know that the power of the gospel has power to deliver us from the penalty of sin. We know that because if you've trusted in Christ, you know you're on your way to heaven one day. You know that you do not have to fear eternal separation from God. You know that Jesus has taken your penalty for sin, all sins, that you've ever committed, that you ever will commit, he died for upon the cross. Colossians 2.13 says that he forgave you of all trespasses. And so you've been forgiven, you've been freed from sin's penalty. But in the last several weeks we've been talking about, yes, the gospel is good news for deliverance from sin's penalty, but it's also good news for being delivered from sin's power. And we've been talking about how can we live a, practical, a practically different life because of this power positional truth. You know, okay, this is great truth, Brian, but how does it transform Monday mornings when I get out of the bed? How does it help me get victory over that habitual sin that I've been struggling with in my life? And so I hope that you're seeing through these last several weeks the path forward for finding deliverance from the power of sin. And last week we talked about this interesting thing that Paul brings up in Romans chapter 7 verses 1 through 13 about the law's function. And we learned last week, here's just a summary statement, we learned that the law's primary function in our lives was to cause us to long for and bring us to a better husband. And so the law that God gave through Moses at Mount Sinai was our schoolmaster. It was to bring us to something better. It was temporary. It was added because of the transgressions till the seed, speaking of Christ, should come, Galatians 3.19. And so this law was meant to be a mirror to show us our true state, to diagnose us accurately, to convince us that we are indeed sinners in need of a Savior. And so that law was meant to bring us to a better husband, a husband that does not need to intimidate through fear of obligation, but a husband that can motivate through his infinite, inexhaustible grace and produce in us loving loyalty. Ladies, which kind of husband would you rather be married to? One who continues to hold you under his thumb of absolute perfection? You know, you didn't exactly cook the meal right. You didn't cook the eggs exactly right. You know, he wanted them over easy and you got them a little bit too well done. You broke the yolk. 
Now, husbands, are we guilty of that sometimes? My wife, she's been listening to my preaching over the last several months, and, and when I get after her for something in the house, she's like, now, now, dear, you can't be giving to me the law all the time. Good pastor's wife. And you know what? She's right. In that moment, we were having a source of disagreement because I had gone into law mode rather than grace mode. And you see, grace will produce obedience. Grace will produce life, pr produce life change. The Bible says it's the grace of God that, that teaches us to deny ungodliness and worldly lusts. But we've got to receive that by faith. We've got to step into that. We've got to rest in grace because Jesus is a better husband. He motivates through his grace. We want to obey him. We want to follow him. And so the greatest constraining power we learned last week against sin is love, not law. It is love, not law. Some of the greatest repenting you and I will ever do, friends, is when we will finally change our mind about our relationship to a law that was ever only temporary, go back, that was ever only temporary, could never bring life, and was only given to bring us into a new and better relationship with a new and better husband. When will we, by faith, settle into the fact that we are no longer under the law, but we are under grace? For sin shall not have dominion over you, because you are not under the law, you're under grace. And so if you want victory over sin, then you must see that God has delivered you from the law, you are dead to the law, you are free from the law, you are no longer under the law, you are joined to a new husband that loves you and has actually changed the inside of you and it's going to start coming out just like that fruit tree does in the spring when it starts to bud new leaves that new life is going to come out if you'll just let it and so that was our message last week we talked about the difference between a life lived under an old husband and a life lived under a new husband and so we see the difference there the law tried to produce behavior out of fear and intimidation but Jesus produces a different way of living out of loving loyalty to him. And so the question today that we're going to seek to answer is, what happens if we refuse that teaching? What happens if we refuse to believe the good news of the gospel that we've been delivered to a better husband? What happens when we still try to live under the law? And we see here in Romans 7, verses 15 through 8, verse 4, what happens? <clears throat> when that occurs. How many of you remember back in the early, way back in the early 80s? <laughs> Some of y'all are older than I am, but uh, I was only two years old when this happened. But in 1982, um, Nancy Reagan was in an elementary public school, and uh, she had, over the last couple of years leading up to 1982, she had been confronted on several occasions with the issue of drug abuse across our country. And one of the kids asked Nancy Reagan about the drug problem, and she said, what should I do when someone offers me drugs? And Nancy Reagan coined the famous phrase in campaign, just say no to drugs. How many of you remember that campaign back in the early 80s? There was another campaign that was born out of the Just Say No campaign. It was the D.A.R.E. campaign. How many of you remember that one? Drug Abuse Resistance Education. And we had police officers come in our elementary school class, give us stickers. And, you know, I was always looking at the police officer's gun. I'm like, ooh, that's a cool thing right there. And no wonder I like guns today. But anyway, um, the, the uh, police officers would come in. And so these two programs... Just Say No and Dare were started as a result of our first lady having this desire to see people set free from drug addiction, drug abuse. Now, one can debate on the effectiveness of these programs and, and the, the effectiveness that these programs had on our culture and on our educational system. If you're to Google uh, some information and research this, you're going to find statistics on both sides of the argument. Some will say this worked really well. It really lowered the statistics for those who are, who are addicted to drugs. On the other side, you'll find arguments that say it didn't really work all that well. You know, we still have a drug problem today, don't we? And so there's this, you know, there's, there's differing opinions on that. I'm not here to debate that this morning, but what I am here today to tell you is this. The Just Say No campaign against sin does not work. You know why I know that? Because I've been there, I've done that, and I've bought every t-shirt in that size. 
in every size imaginable. That's what Paul had done. Paul says in Romans 7 verse 15, For that which I do, I allow not. For what I would, that do I not. But what I hate, that do I. How many of you would be honest enough to say that that's been your life as a Christian? You're like, well, man, I remember years ago the preacher preached and I realized I was a sinner. I needed a Savior. And I remember asking Jesus to become my Savior, to forgive me of all my sin. But, but then I kept on sinning. And it seemed like the harder I tried, the more I failed. The more I tried to say no, the more I was defeated and I was frustrated and I was miserable. In fact, that's what Paul says at the end of this passage we read this morning in verse 24. He says, oh, wretched man. That word wretched only shows up twice in the entire New Testament. And it doesn't mean, I think, what the connotation we think it means today. The word wretched here simply means miserable, frustrated completely in a state of misery because his life, he knew it should be different. He wanted it to be different. He said, there are some things that I truly want to do, but I find that I cannot do them. In fact, the harder I try, the greater I fall. How many of you have ever experienced that in your Christian life? Raise your hand if that's you. The harder you try, the greater you feel. Here's why that happens. How many of you remember um, being educated on fires and if you had a fire start in your house? How many of you remember that, that there were certain fires that you could not put out with water? How many of you, you know, ever tried to put out a grease fire with water? How did that work? It actually just spread the fire. It actually just fueled the fire. You know what we do in our Christian life? We think that more thou shalts, more law will put out the fire of sin. We think that if we just try really hard enough to extinguish the fire of sin in our own strength, we can quench it, we can conquer it. All that does is spread the fire. Now you might raise your hand and you might say that that's the case or not. But deep down we know this to be true. That the harder we try, the greater we fall. The just say no. While the just say no campaign with drug addiction might have helped. Okay, we're not here to debate whether that helped or not. We know that the just say no campaign to sin does not work. But what happens is <laughs> churches double down on trying to just say no in more sophisticated ways. How do they do it? Preachers will get up and they'll scare you into just saying no. How did they do it with drug addiction? Do you remember how they did it? I will never forget the campaign on the TV. This is your brain. This is your brain on drugs. <laughs> the egg, right? You know, they had the egg and then they cracked the egg and fried it. Listen, that was scary, okay? And, and, and I remember watching that. I'm thinking, I don't want my brain fried, you know? But how do preachers do it? Preachers will say, listen, the way that you've got to resist sin, the way that you're ever going to overcome sin is, think about what will happen if you do. You know, the consequences of sin will scare you into obedience and submission. But here's the lie that the devil tells all of us. Well, I'm the exception. I can see, yeah, I know those consequences might happen, but I can sin and nobody will know about it and I'll be able to get away with it. So scare tactics really do not work long term. They might work for the short term, but they do not work for the long term. Here's another reason I know this. How many of you have ever known somebody who's gone to the doctor for the upteenth time and been told you've got to change the way you're eating or you're going to die? That was a scare tactic question. Does it work for some people? It might. But we know that for some people it doesn't work no matter how much you tell them. So what pastors do and what sometimes churches do is they try to scare us into behavior change. So this more sophisticated way of saying no. So they try to scare you into saying no. The second way they try to do this is through Christian disciplines. They'll say that the answer to saying no to sin is in reading your Bible more. 
in praying more. Um, you know, I used to struggle with this because I heard about people like George Mueller who used to get up at 3 a.m. And, and pray for four hours and they had amazing answers to prayer. And so in my uh, young mind, I thought, okay, the amount of hours you put in determines what answers you get out. And, and then I thought, okay, well, if that's the case, then yeah, I've really, I've really been struggling with this sin. And so I just need to spend lots of hours in prayer focused on that sin, focused on asking God to help me overcome it. Um, you know, reading God's word more, uh, Christian disciplines. And so people will say that Christian disciplines is the way that you say no to sin. Now, are Christian disciplines wrong in and of themselves? No, they're good. Hey, is it great to read the Bible? Yes. How do you uh, know about truth except you read the Bible? Is it great to talk to God? Is it great to spend time in prayer? Yes. Those disciplines are not wrong, but the motivation behind them can be wrong. The reason you do it can be wrong. And so the church has just come up with more sophisticated ways of saying no. They try to scare you into obedience. They say that the way that you say no is just really get disciplined. Just double down. Just, you know, get stronger spiritual muscles to say no. And then the third way is they guilt, they shame, and they even go to the dangerous teaching that, well, if you still sin, you might not be saved anyway which then goes right back to scare tactic number one, to tactic number one. And so what happens is, time, little by little, over time, churches become nothing more than behavior management centers. Do better, try harder. Here's the next Christian self-help book. Here's the next conference. Here's the next fancy speaker who's repackaged the Just Say No campaign in a little bit of a different way, and that's going to help. And you know what's crazy? Is the divorce rate inside the church is the same as outside the church? Men who are addicted to pornography is the same inside the church as it is outside the church? Debt, people that are living under a constant weight of debt, the statistics aren't any different. But yet, what do we do? We double down. We go back in and we live a miserable, wretched, frustrated life behind the scenes because we come to church and we put on a good front. Hey, everything's fine. You know, I'm not dealing with major issues in my life. I am okay. I am blameless according to the law. But yet, Paul had a covetous heart. Paul lived a miserable life because he was trying to live with two husbands. You can't do it. You see, it's not that Christian disciplines are wrong in and of themselves. They can help. It's not that the consequences of sin shouldn't stir us to consider our ways. And it's not that we shouldn't experience some guilt and shame over our sin because we should. But the danger is this. Colossians 2.23 says, These, speaking of rules, regulations, traditions of men, disciplines, these have indeed an appearance of wisdom in promoting self-made religion and asceticism and severity to the body. But the Bible declares that they are of no value in stopping the indulgence of the flesh. Those things will never put out the fire of sin in your life. So if we are ever going to truly change, our thinking must change. You cannot fight the flesh with more flesh, no matter how we like to dress up that flesh. Paul had a great track record according to the flesh. Philippians 3 verses 6 through 9 tell us. You cannot fight flesh with more flesh. You cannot fight fire with more fire. But, this, but the church just doubles down into more flesh-based coping mechanisms. But my friends, today I'm here to tell you that right thinking leads to right believing, which then leads to right behaving. You see, the battle of the Christian life is not fought out here it's fought in here. It's fought in the mind. Paul would say this in this passage that we read this morning. Look at verse 23. 
He says, but I see another law in my members warring against the law of my mind to bring me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members. When some people read this passage, they mistakenly misinterpret this passage to mean, oh, we have two natures as believers in Christ. Wrong. You're about to hear absolute truth that proves that we have one nature as born-again children of God. But what we do have a battle for in our life is not two natures, but two laws that are battling on the battleground of the mind. So the law of the mind is battling against the law of sin. So the battle of the Christian life is waged upon the battleground of one's mind. Paul says it like this in 2 Corinthians 10, verses 3 through 5. He says, For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. They're not flesh and blood, fleshly. But they're mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. He says, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. What do we think about throughout the course of a week? What do we set our minds upon? Do we set our minds upon Okay, this all rests on me. I've got to do better. I've got to try harder. I've got to just say no. And we wonder why we're defeated. Because all that is, no matter how we dress it up, is a reliance, is a dependence upon our flesh and not a dependence upon God. Paul here said, the very things that I don't want to do, I find myself doing. And the things that I, the, 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 the things that I hate, that's what I find myself doing. And so Satan is a deceiver. We just sang in that last congregational song about, O oh, church, arise. And we said that we must stand against the devil's lies. One of the devil's greatest lies that he tells us as Christians today are some lies that we're about to cover here in this passage. Because Paul would have never found victory in his Christian life over the power of sin until he set his mind, the law of his mind, upon the truth. So, what is God trying to teach us here in this passage? First of all, He is trying to teach us the truth in this passage that we are a new creature with a new nature. We are not a house divided against itself. We have one new nature and it does have the upper hand in this battle. One of the greatest lies that Satan is perpetrating against the church today is that when we are saved, we have still the old man that's alive and the new man that's alive. But Romans chapter 6 definitively declares that your old man died at the cross. It is dead. Now you might say, but what I experience is different. Are you going to stop Gauging truth on experience, isn't that walking by sight rather than by faith? Doesn't God call us to walk by faith and not by sight? Yes. And so what the Bible teaches here in this passage is that Paul had one new nature, not two natures battling it out. He had one new man. Let me prove that to you. Verse 15, he says, For that which I do, I allow not. For what I would, that do I not. But what I hate, that do I. Now you might say, well, Brian, doesn't that prove Paul had two natures? No, think about this. We have here a person whose desire deep down is to obey God, but who lacks the power to live out this reality for some reason. Isn't that what he said? He said, there's some things I really want to do, but I can't. There's some things that I really don't want to do that I find myself doing. Tell me, tell me, is this describing a lost person or a saved person? When Paul clearly says over in Romans chapter 3, verses 10 through 12, that before salvation, nothing good in us dwells. We are altogether uh, evil, altogether bad. In fact, let's just read it for a second. Romans 3, verses 10 through 12, it says, As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is none that understandeth. There is none that seeketh after God. They are all gone out of the way. They are together become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good, no, not one. 
So what kind of heart does this person have in verse 15 if he really desires to do something different? Look look down at verse 17. Now then, it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. Verse 18, for I know that in me, and then he makes this distinction, that is in my flesh dwelleth no good thing. For to will is present with me. If if Paul wasn't a saved individual here, one of the biggest debates amongst scholars about Romans 7 verses 15 through the end of the chapter is, is Paul describing himself pre-salvation or post-salvation? I believe clearly from the evidence of Scripture that this is describing a man who was saved, but a man who had tried to go back under the law as a good Pharisee that he had grown up with his whole life. Romans 7 verse 9 proves that. I was alive without the law once. Every time Paul uses that word alive in context, it's talking about a spiritual birth, a spiritual reality. He was alive without the law once. Where did that happen? Road to Damascus when he got saved by the grace of God. But then he brought back in this law and this law convinced him he was a covetous person at heart. And so what Paul is laying out here through way of induction is he's saying, listen, I am different Something happened to me at salvation which makes me different. There is something good dwelling in me now. Oh, I know that in my flesh dwelleth no good thing, but I have a new will. I want to do right. You see, if Paul had two natures, as many people think, as we have been taught, this verse would read entirely different. Verse 15. Here's how verse 15 would read if Paul still had two natures fighting. He would say something like this. I understand very well what I am doing. For I am practicing what I like to do. Half the time I do evil things, and the other half I practice good. I delight to do both, and I find no conflict in this, as it is perfectly normal for me to satisfy both my natures. Is that what Paul says? No, that's not what Paul says. Paul says he's miserable. The most miserable person in all the world is someone who cannot bring their performance into line with their new nature that they've been given through the new birth. So he says, For I know that in me that is in my flesh dwelleth no good thing. For to will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good I find not. Note that he doesn't say that he is no good at all, like he could have said, because he said that back in Romans chapter 3, verses 10 through 12. But he said that nothing good dwelt in his flesh... And that word flesh means flesh. It means an old way of getting your needs met. If you had to define flesh today, it's not talking about flesh and blood, and that can be confusing in the Bible too. It's not talking about flesh and blood. It's talking about the old ways that we try to get our needs met. Self-dependence, self-preservation, self-worship. The old ways that we try... Let me ask you a question. Is the need... For um, love, wrong. No, it's not wrong. God gave you the need for love, didn't he? But when you meet that need for love through your old ways and not through God, you know what it becomes? It becomes sin. I'm going to mention that three-letter word that people aren't supposed to talk about in church, the word sex. Do you know that's an actual God-given desire given to you by God? But when you go about in your old ways to try to meet those needs, it is walking according to the flesh. It is sin. So what are you doing? How are you doing, Christian, at living a life walking after the Spirit? What needs are you trying to meet outside of trusting in the sufficiency of Christ? What Paul teaches here in this passage, what the Lord is teaching to us through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, is that we are new beings on the inside. Romans 7 22 says, for I delight in the law of God after the inward man. The inward man. If you have trusted Jesus Christ as your Savior, the Bible declares that you have a new man and that you truly delight to follow God on the inside. In fact, the Bible says in Ephesians 4, verses 23 and 24, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind. What does that mean? Repent. Change your mind about what? That you put on the new man. The new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. And that word new there, 
There, there are two Greek words for new in the Bible. This is so cool. There are two Greek words in the Bible for new. One is neos, which just means an improvement upon something old. For instance, let me illustrate. We have a car dealer here this morning, uh, Philip Fitzgerald. He sells cars over at the Toyota dealership, okay? And let's say that I had a 1998 Toyota Camry. And I went to Philip next week and said, Philip, I want to get a new 2016 Toyota Camry. Now, that would be the Greek word neos new. I'm upgrading, I'm getting a newer model of a Toyota Camry, but it's the same thing. It's still a Camry. Yes, it's an upgraded model, new features, but it's neos new. That is not the word the Bible uses to describe us as believers in Christ. We are not an improvement on something old. We are kainos new. The word kainos means this. Let's say I had a 98 Toyota Camry and I wanted to get a new car. It would be like me trading in my 1998 Toyota Camry for an Aston Martin prototype sport car. Not a perfect illustration, but I really like it, so I wanted to give you that illustration. That's the word new. The Bible says you are so new, you don't even know how new you are. Oh, and I get, I'm sorry I got loud, got excited. Because we're so new, Christian, we don't even believe it. Because I feel so old. When will we stop walking according to our feelings? You set your mind on the truth of the gospel of what God now declares you to be. He says you have one new nature. Do you really think if you started believing that you were a saint who sometimes happens to still sin, but you know what the church mostly believes? Well, I'm just a sinner, and sometimes I happen to act like a saint. But you know what the Bible declares? The Bible declares you're a saint. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 2 through 9, Paul is writing to one of the most bad behavior churches in all the known world at that time, Corinth, look it up, but yet he wrote to them in such a way that he said, look at who you are in Christ by birth. Look at the fact that you are a saint. Isn't it amazing that we tie the word saint to performance, don't we? We like to reserve the word saint for some, you know, elderly person. And I'm not saying that we can't use that word in that endearing way. You know, we got our senior saints at church. But everybody in this room who is trusted in the finished work of Jesus is a saint. You have a new nature. We like to think of the word saint as this person who really performed well to somehow earn the trophy. You see, we earn this trophy of behavior. But the Bible says that our identity, the source of our identity, is not determined by what we do, but by who we are in. The Bible says, as in Adam all die, so in Christ shall all be made, there's that word, alive. So the source of our spiritual identity is not determined by what we do, but who you are in. You were a sinner because of your first birth. You were born in Adam. But you are no longer a sinner because of your second birth. You've been born again if you've trusted in Christ as your Savior. And so we have been made a new man, which is after God created Kainos, created, brand new, in righteousness and holiness. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he, there's the Greek word again, he is a kainos creature, a new creature, completely new. All things are passed away. Behold, all things are become, and there's the Greek word again, kainos, new. God says that we have been given a new divine nature, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, that by these ye might be partakers of the divine nature. God does not share space in your spirit with an old nature. There is one new man. Why would Jesus set you up? One of the illustrations that Jesus used there in the Gospels about, uh, about demonic possession is he says, listen, a house divided against itself cannot stand. Why would Jesus set you up for failure? Why would Jesus keep your old man alive and give you a new man? No, the Bible says Jesus crucified your old man. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. The life which I now live, I live by the faith. You see, it's a life of faith. It's a life, the greatest thing you and I need in our life is to set our minds upon what is true. And Satan will do everything he can. He is the father of lies. He is the master of deception. He has battled me this entire week in 
preparing this message. He is battling your thinking right now because he does not want you to know the truth of who you are now in Christ. When will we step into the reality that we have been made new at the core of our being and that there is something inside of us that does not want to sin? Listen, if you don't have that desire, then you need to get saved. You might say, well, well I, oh, I'm not sure. I'm not sure if I have the desire. Listen, has there ever been a time in your life when you wish that you could never sin again? Then t- let me tell you what. You've got the Spirit of God in you. The Spirit of God creates that desire in you. And so Paul is teaching here that we are a new creature with a new nature. Paul didn't want to do these things. For the will was present with him, but the how-to. Isn't that where it breaks down, the how-to? Paul said, you're not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. If so, be that the Spirit of God dwell in you. Now, if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. Do you have the Spirit of Christ? Then the Bible says, Lie not one to another, seeing that you have put off the old man with his deeds and have put on the new man, which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him. There are so many more verses, friends, but I just want to tell you this. This morning, if you're a believer in Christ, you do not have two natures. You have one new man. You have a born-again nature. You were by nature children of wrath, Ephesians 2, 3, but you are no longer. You've been made to partake of the divine nature, and your spirit is holy because the Holy Spirit is the one living inside of you. If you look at 1 Corinthians 3, verses 16 and 17, you'll see that if the Holy Spirit dwells in you, then what conclusion must we come to? There's a part of us that has been made holy. It's been transformed. We were given a new heart through the new birth. We are new creations. We've been given His new spirit, kainos new. Not a transfer of you know, an old model for just a barely upgraded model. No, a completely different way of living, a completely new life. Which brings us to this second truth, and it's this. Sin might still be in you, but it is no longer of you. It no longer determines the core of your new identity. Paul says twice in this passage something so phenomenal that we must point out one more time. He says in verse 17, Now then, it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. Paul said, No, I've had a radical transformation of my nature... It's no longer I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. He says again in verse 20, It is no more I that do it, but sin dwelleth in me. There is a clear distinction in these two verses between the new I that Paul was made through his crucifixion with Christ, Galatians 2.20, and the remaining parasite called sin dwelling in his old fleshly ways. Let me ask you a question. How many of you have a gold crown in your mouth? Say, ah. Ah. No, I don't. I just have silver. I wish I had some gold. That'd make me feel rich. How many of you have a gold crown in your mouth? Raise your hand. All right. Brother Tim Matthews, since he's closer to the pulpit, I want to point you out. Brother Tim, are you a gold mine? No. Brother Wayne, are you a gold mine? No. You've got gold in you. But it is not of you. How many of you have ever gotten a splinter in your foot? Raise your hand. Or anywhere. Ever gotten a splinter? Do you walk around that whole day with a splinter in your arm saying, Hello, I'm a totem pole. Hello, I'm a totem pole. How dumb would that be? You laugh, but oh my friend, please catch the distinction of what Paul is teaching here. You know what we do when we sin? Oh, I'm a sinner! Oh, I'm a sinner! And we think somehow that makes God forgive us quicker and better because we like, you know, Oh, so I'm, a, I'm a sinner! And uh, uh, man, I just can't do anything right. Yep, self-fulfilling prophecies. You keep believing that and you'll keep on sinning. Until you believe by faith, God has made you new. You are a saint Yes, you still have something inside of you called the power of sin, but it is no longer your nature to sin. 
In fact, you can't make sense of some of the verses in 1 John 3 and 4 unless you understand that what John is talking about in 1 John 3 and 4 is he's talking about the Spirit. The Spirit can't sin. When you are walking in the Spirit, it is impossible to sin. That's why the greatest problem in the church today is not sin. It is walking according to the flesh, which leads to sin. And when we change our mind about that, and when we understand that our identity, yes, we might still have sin in us, but it's not of us. Just because you have a gold crown in your tooth doesn't make you a gold mine. Just because you have a splinter in your foot doesn't make you a totem pole. No, you have wood present in you, but it's not of you. You have gold in your tooth, but it's not of you. Boy, don't we wish it was, but it's not. Neither is this good man anything other than good because he has evil present in him. Paul had evil present with him, but he was no longer evil by nature. Why? Because he desired to do something differently. He wanted to do what was right. He desired to do what was right, but it was the how-to. And what was hindering his how-to? It was his continual thinking that the law had anything for him. That the law, isn't it amazing? We come to a right conclusion about the law for salvation. The law does nothing to justify. But yet somehow we go back into the law and think that the law has something to do with our sanctification. Galatians 3 verses 1 through 3 is the definitive answer on that failed thinking. But what happens is we continue to fuel the law of sin as long as we look for the source of our identity in anything other than Jesus and his grace alone. Paul gets to the end of this passage here and he says, O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? Paul was desperate. Have you ever been desperate for deliverance over sin? been there. He was wretched. He was miserable. And he asked this question, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? Now, when we read that verse, here's what we think. Oh, yeah, Paul's long, uh, you know, wistfully longing for the day when his body will be changed and he'll be raptured. And so what we do in our minds is we jump from verse 24 of Romans 7 over to um, verse 23 of Romans 8. Look at verse 25. Present reality. I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then with the mind I myself serve the law of God. What's that law referring to? That law is referring to the law of the Spirit that we're about to find out about. He's setting it up because he's about to go into verse uh, chapter 8, verses 1 through 4. But with the flesh, the law of sin. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. Do you remember John chapter 8? John chapter 8, Jesus says, Neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. The hope of ever finding victory over the power of sin is believing the promise that you are no longer condemned because of your sin. Why? Because Jesus was condemned for you. So believe that truth. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus. There's the law of God Paul was talking about in verse 25 of Romans 7. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do, and that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, condemned sin in the flesh, that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. After the Spirit. Let me illustrate what Paul was trying to do in his flesh in Romans 7. I need a strong man who works out. Somebody, a couple of people pointed, but Isaiah, come on up here. I like Isaiah. He had his birthday yesterday, 16 years old. Everybody say happy birthday. All right, Isaiah. I got some 10-pound weights here. Just put those in your hands. Okay, pump a couple. Come on, come on. Good, good. 
He's like, why couldn't you do five pounds? All right. Now, Isaiah, here, here's, here's what I want you to do. I want you to hold those out straight like this. How's it going? Can't hold them for long? Do we have somebody stronger in the building? No, no, I'm just kidding. Whether Isaiah works out, whether Isaiah, you know, had, you know, huge muscles or not, in his strength right now, he can only hold them for a little bit. Now here, watch me. I'll try to do a little bit better. I got this. No problem. <laughs> and here's what we do with sin. We say, I've got this. No problem. And then we fail. We drop the ball. We drop the weights. Go ahead. You can sit down for a second. We fail. But, but, but then you know what happens? We're told, work out. Eat your spiritual vitamins. And get stronger. Okay. And we do it a little bit longer the next time. And so we think... We think, oh, I'm making progress. But we fail again. You can only hold those weights for so long. What does Hebrews say? It says lay aside the weight. What's the weight? Unbelief. Not believing in the power of God. You're believing in your own power. You're believing in your own strength. We do not need... That's not the approach to the Christian life. Paul tried that approach over and over and over and over. He wanted to do that. He wanted to hold those weights. He, he, he desired to say no to sin. He desired to live a different life. But what was happening is, is he was simply fueling the law of sin as long as he looked to anyone and anything other than Jesus and his grace alone. Paul says this over in 2 Corinthians 12, 9. My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. You see, the arm of the flesh will fail you. It will fail you. Hezekiah said in 2 Chronicles 32, verse 8, With him is an arm of flesh, but with us, the Lord our God, to help us and to fight our battles. The eternal God is thy refuge, and underneath are his everlasting arms. And so God mean, means to come and live inside of you, and he has un ceasable strength. He has limitless power. And so it's no longer you holding this. It's him holding up your arms. It just, there, there's so many pictures of this, even in the Old Testament. These two verses. And then Moses, as long as he held up his arms, the armies had victory. You know what we need? We need to stop thinking we can do it. We need to depend upon God and his grace. Those weights are something that you can never carry long term. And so what Paul says here is, there's a battle going on being waged in the mind. And it's a battle over whether we're going to believe the truth of the gospel. And the truth of the gospel says, you've been made a new man. You have a new nature, something so new, you're still figuring out how to turn the car on. I mean, it's so brand new and it's so amazing, it's going to set you to, to live in a completely different way. God says, set your mind on that. Believe that. Understand that sin might still be in you, but it's no longer of you. And we will continue to fuel the law of sin as long as we look to anyone and anything other than Jesus and his grace alone. Paul could never get victory over that law of sin by fighting with the same rules that that law had. He had to be given a higher law, the law of the spirit of life, which could set him free. You see, the law says, just say no to sin. You know what grace says? Just say yes to the Spirit. 
When you say yes to the Spirit, you know what's going to happen? You're going to find that you've been saying no to sin. Walk in the Spirit and you will not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. And so what some of us have to do is we have to forget this thing called sin. You mean forget it? Don't be, don't be sin conscious anymore? That sounds weird. Be Savior conscious. And He'll take care of the sin. Because as long as you're aware of the weights, good luck. But as long as you understand that it's Him in you, through you, of you, Christ around me, Christ behind me, Christ in front of me, Christ in me, that's the only way I know, and that's the only way that Paul pointed to that he knew to see victory over the power of sin in his life was through Jesus Christ our Lord, and specifically that happened walking in the Spirit. And I hope you'll come back next week as we talk about what it means to walk in the Spirit. Let's pray together.